This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, this is the third and final lecture on the chapter on cost of capital. And in the previous lectures, in the first one, we looked uh, at the cost of equity in isolation, which was simply using a formula. Uh, in the last lecture, in the second one, we looked at the cost of debt, where given it's normally going to be redeemable debt, um, it is that much more time consuming because there's no quick way, no formula. Finally, though, in this uh, lecture, we need to put the two together because, as I did say at the end of uh, the last one, companies, of course, tend not to borrow all entirely from equity or obviously not entirely from debt, but a combination of the two. Uh, and we need to be able to calculate an overall or an average uh, cost of borrowing, an average cost of capital, the weighted average cost of capital. Uh, and here it is in itself quite straightforward. Uh, there is a formula on the formula sheet, but as I'll explain as we go through this, uh, basically ignore it. The formula on the formula sheet doesn't normally work, but I'll explain why later. Uh, but let me show you how we do it with two examples. Example 9, example 10. Uh, example 9, a very quick one. Example 10, well, you'll see why. It takes a bit longer, but first of all, example 9. JPLC is financed as follows. Five million a dollar shares. That's the nominal value, remember. Quoted at $2.50 come div. On which a constant dividend of 32 cents per share is about to be paid. Uh, in addition, they've got four million eight percent debentures quoted at 92x int. And because it doesn't say anything about repayment, you automatically assume that they're irredeemable. We want to calculate the overall cost of borrowing. Well, first of all, we need to work out the cost of equity and of debt individually. Uh, the cost of equity? Set enough time earlier, so I'm not going to repeat it all. Although, in fact, it's a constant dividend, so it's very easy, but the formula still works. Uh, because the current dividend is 32 times 1 plus the growth rate, well, the growth rate zero, it's constant. So 32 over the X div market value. Well, the market value, if I work in cents, currently is 250, but it's cum div. I explained before to go X div, subtract the dividend about to be paid for 32, which leaves us with an X div value of 218. Uh, plus G, the rate of growth, but again, G is zero uh, because it's constant dividend. So the cost of equity, 32 over 218, 14.68%. And remember, for cost of equity, tax is irrelevant. Uh, dividends aren't allowable uh, for company tax. Uh, what about the cost of debt? Well, again, a lovely easy one here because it's irredeemable. I say again, debt's always irredeemable if you're not given a repayment date. We only want the cost of the company. So they're paying interest of eight a year, but the interest is tax allowable and the tax rate's 30%. So they're only actually, it's only costing a net 560 a year on a market value of 92, that is X interest, which means the cost of debt, 5.6 divided by 92 is 6.09%. So there are the individual costs, and incidentally, we talk a lot about risk later, but I'm certainly not surprised that the cost of equity is higher than the cost of debt, because shares are more risky. You know, with debt you're getting fixed interest, it's not going to change. With equity, 
They're expecting 32 a year, but obviously the chances of it being 32 a year are remote. It might be higher, it might be lower. It's more risky. Oh, that's uh, irrelevant for what we're doing. It then says, what's the weighted average cost? Well, it means what it says. We'll take an average of the two, but we weight them by the total market values. Let me show you what I mean. Equity, debt, the total market value of the equity, the total borrowing from equity, there are 5 million shares. They've each got an X interest market value of, what was it, 218. So the total equity borrowing, 5 million, $2.18, is 10.9 million. Where as far as the debt's concerned, there's 4 million nominal, but the market value is 92 per 100. So the market value in total of the equity, 3.68 million. And so the total market value of the company, debt plus equity, is 14.58 million. Uh, we know the individual costs, we've just calculated them. 14.68 and 6.09. Well, to get the average, we take a weighted average, but we weight by the total X D X interest market values. So um, equity multiplied by equity is 10.9 out of a total market value of 14.58. Whereas debt, 3.68, again, out of a total of 14.58. And so let's do the arithmetic, 14.68 times 10.9 divided by 14.58. Is 10.97. Uh, debt 6.09 times the weighting 3.68 divided by 14.58 is 1.54. Given a, giving a total or a weighted average of 12.51. 12.51%. Now, I'll talk about the relevance of that later, shortly. But arithmetically, for the moment, it couldn't really be much easier. Cost of the cost of debt, we've been through the rules. The weighting by the total X to X market values. All right, that was a very, very quick one. Um, certainly, the arithmetic never gets any harder for the actual weighting. Um, the only problem is, of course, that equity more likely will be growing dividends. We've dealt with it, but then it needs to use the whole formula. Uh, and debt, more likely it will be redeemable debt. So calculating the cost of debt uh, clearly takes that bit longer. But once you've got the cost equity cost of debt, this weighting can't really be any harder. Um, usually there are only two sources of finance. There could be three, could be four. There could be equity. There could be different types of debt. Doesn't matter. Work out the cost of each source individually. Then weight them. If there are three sources of finance, fine. Takes a few seconds longer, but that's all. Anyway, that's how we calculate it. To turn it a bit more into um, a full one, look at example 10, where here, equity, 10 million shares, quoted at 320, but the dividends are growing. 
Uh, debt, six million debt at 105, but they're redeemable. So this is what I meant. Obviously, this is going to take a little bit longer, but again, we want the weighted average cost. And again, in your own interests, I really, really, rather than just stare at me doing it, I really would have a go yourself. The only, the only way you really learn is by doing things yourself and then learning from any mistakes. I really would pause this lecture, have a go yourself, it shouldn't take long. And then come back to the lecture, check if you got it right, great, if you made a mistake. You know, learn from the mistake. All right, well, I will assume that you did what I just said and paused and had a go yourself. So check with me whether or not you got it right. Um, work out the two individually. Cost of equity first. Uh, it's a grand dividend, use the formula. So D0, the current dividend is 20 cents uh, times 1 plus the growth rate, 8%, so 1.08. Divided by the exited market value, 320 plus G, the growth rate, 8%, which gives a cost of equity of. Uh, 0.1475 or 14.75 percent. That's quick enough. Uh, what about the cost of debt? It's redeemable, so set up the after tax flows and then calculate the internal rate of return. Um, so debt, I said earlier, always do it on $100 nominal. And so the current market value of $100 nominal is 105. There's interest. The coupon rate is 10%. So on $100, there's interest of $10 a year. But net of tax at 30%. Is seven dollars a year, uh, and finally, sorry, I put one to eight for some unknown reason. They were redeemable in six years' time. Uh, finally, the repayment in six years' time, the redemption. It's a premium of ten percent, ten percent on nominal, so one hundred and ten. Uh, and again, it's not tax allowable. The payment could be the full one hundred and ten. We need the internal rate of return, the two guesses. Again, I'll guess at 10% first, simply because it's in the middle of the tables. So 105 now is 105. The annuity, $6 a year, sorry, $7 a year for six years. So the six year annuity factor at 10% is 4355 the redemption, a single one-off flow, so the ordinary present value factor, uh, six years, 10%, is 0.564. So the present values, uh, 30.49, not which way you round, 110 times 0.564, 62.04. And so a net present value twelve point four seven negative. Well, because it's negative, the internal rate of return must be less than ten percent. So I'll make my second guess at let's say five percent. Uh, and at 5%, 105 is 105. The six-year annuity at 5% is 5.076. Um, the ordinary present value factor, six years at 5%, is 0.746. So the present values, the annuity is seven times 
110 times 0 0.746, 82.06, it does keep doing this. And therefore the net present value Twelve point five nine. And so having made the two guesses, we can approximate to the internal rate of return uh, the cost of debt, the IRR. Well, just like I did before, so I hope I don't need to spend too long chatting through it. Um, we know it's more than 5%. Uh, to get to an NPV of zero, we need a fall of 12.59. So the total fall to go between 5 and 10 is, well, 12.59 plus 12.47. So it'd be that proportion of the difference between the two 10 and 5, the difference between the two is 5%. Which gives me an internal rate of return of, if I do the last bit first, 12.59 divided by uh, 25.06 times 5 plus 5, 7.51%. Uh, Again, as you'd expect, it's lower than the cost of equity, partly because debt is less risky, so investors will accept less, uh, but also, of course, because of tax. Uh, debt interest gets tax relief, whereas uh, equity doesn't. Finally, though, the weighted average, which can never really be any harder than it was last time. Uh, the weighting, the total market values of equity and debt. Equity with 10 million shares at 320x div. So 10 million at 320 is 32 million. Debt, 6 million nominal at 105 per 100. Is 6.3 million, is it not? Yeah, 6.3 million. So the total market value 38.3. Uh, the individual costs. Uh, 14.75 for equity. 7.51 for debt. And therefore weight them. Uh, equity multiplied by 32 of, over a total of 38.3. Debt 6.3 over a total of 38.3. So for equity, I get 12.32. Uh, for debt, One point two four, and so a weighted average cost of thirteen point five six percent. So I hope that's right. I hope you got it right. Um, a few tiny things before uh, I finish this. I mean, this this chapter I, I've just been through the arithmetic. There's more discussion to come later in various ways. Uh, but a few things. First of all, I did mention earlier, there is a formula, the formula sheet for the weighted average cost of capital, which really does annoy me. I don't know why they do this. Um, the weighted average cost of capital, VE over VE plus VD times KE plus VD over VE plus VD 
uh, times kd1 minus t. And the VE, VD are the market values of equity and debt. So it starts off fine, you know, compared with what I just did. We take the cost of equity, which is the same as the investor's required return, KE, and we multiply by the push of market value equity over the total. No problem. But it's the second bit that's the problem. We take the proportions of debt to total market value, that's fine. But we should multiply by the cost of debt. And I did explain earlier that the cost of debt is not KD1 minus T unless the debt is irredeemable. And usually in the exam, it's redeemable. And so it always annoys me. First of all, I don't see it, you need a formula anyway. I think you've got to agree that <coughs> whether or not you find calculation of equity and debt easy or difficult, the actual weighting is easy enough. You don't need a formula for it. But secondly, for most questions in the exam, the formula doesn't work. All right, you may be lucky and get irredeemable, but usually it's redeemable. In which case, you've got to work at the IRR. So, that's one point. Uh, a second point is that I think, again, you should know from earlier exams that the relevance of the weighted average cost of capital is that certainly on occasions, when we come to appraise projects, you know, in a two or three chapters' time, on occasions, we will discount the weighted average cost of capital. And the question would have you work out the cost first, 31.56, and then use it to discount. Uh, but incidentally, you wouldn't expect to discount at funny rates. If you were going to discount, you'd do the nearest percent, so you'd discount at 14%. Now, on occasions, that is true, but as I have, did say for the early exam, and I will say again later, I can't do everything at once here. Uh, in fact, it would only be valid if we were investing in a project with the same level of risk as the company. If you're investing in a much more risky project, you'll want a higher return than 14%. Um, if you're investing in a, a project with very little risk, a lower return. Uh, and secondly, it would only really be valid if our gearing was keeping being kept the same. Because you see, if the company raises more debt, for example, then on the one hand, you have a bigger proportion at the cost of debt, which is cheap. On the other hand, more debt. I, we are going to discuss it later anyway, but makes equity more risky. And so the cost of equity goes up, and the weighted average is going to change. Uh, and so although you've got to be able to calculate weighted average, well, you know, I wouldn't have done it if there aren't plenty of times in the exam when it's relevant, uh, certainly it's very likely you'll need to do different things. Particularly, I've mentioned the last sentence, I think, something called um, uh, <laughs> when the gearing changes, we use something called adjusted present value, do things slightly differently. But I'll cover all that later for the moment and just be clear that you can calculate the weighted average. And very last of all, and we're coming to it in the next two lectures. Although the weighted average calculation is always like that, it's never any harder. And the cost of debt calculation is always the way we've done it. I did mention earlier that for cost of equity, a more common alternative to using that formula we used is to use something called capital asset pricing model. Well, yet again, we're going to cover it shortly. But however we end up working on the cost of equity, the weighted average arithmetic uh, remains the same. So, 
that's that for that chapter.